Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Friday Five. I missed you last week. Uh, unfortunately, my elder dog passed that day, um, last Friday, and so I started a broadcast to talk a little bit about it, um, but I wasn't in the right headspace. <laughs> so um, one of the things, just before we get started in talking to my young children about our family dog, um, having died was um, just some basic uh, guidelines that can help you talk about death, dying, um, or even sickness can be uh, to stay true and brief. A lot of times we feel nervous talking about information like this. We feel nervous um, trying to figure out what the words are to tell our children um, what's going on either in the world or in their family. And a lot of times the way people react to nervousness is they try to add words. And a lot of times this just creates confusion. And it's helpful to just stick with something that is true and something that is brief. And then letting the child let you know if they have questions. Um, usually the younger the child is, the more um, almost aloof they are <laughs> about the whole thing. And they don't have any questions as they get uh, closer to six. And after six, they might have more questions, but you definitely want to keep it true and brief so that the child can um, have their own experience rather than us going in and sharing a lot of excess information that might just add a lot more confusion for the child. The second thing that can be really helpful when talking about death, dying, chronic illness, um, those kinds of heavier topics can be not to use euphemisms. Um, so saying passed away is not very clear in terms of what happened. Um, something, sometimes we say things like um, the big sleep or something like that. That can create sometimes confusion, but also fear about regular things that happen in the child's day to day. So if we use the term sleep, when we really mean dead, um, that can be really confusing and potentially scary for the child to think that maybe they will go to sleep and then die, right? So we want to be really clear about what words we're using with young children. And even though it might feel cra uh, uh, just sort of a little crude to just sort of say dead or death, we tend to use euphemisms to soften it a bit it's more helpful for the child, the young child under six to understand what's going on. So in the example of my pet, um, we had had her for 12 years and this was on the heels of losing our other um, pet the year before who also passed at 12. And so they had had some experience, but the way the conversation kind of felt or, or sounded like, um, was, you know, I want to, I want to talk to you about something that's important to our family. So I prefaced it. I let them know that, you know, I'm not just inviting them for jokes. Like I actually want to talk to them that gets them in the right headspace. And then I said, um, Sequoia, which was the name of our pet. I said, Sequoia died today. And then I paused, right? True and brief. That was the truest sen sentence. And then I waited to see if there was any questions. Um, and uh, my younger child, who's five, did not have any questions. And my older child, who is eight, she did have questions. Um, she said, did the um, vet help her die? And she had that context from our previous pet that had passed. Um, but I said yes, uh, because I took her to the vet, because it was quite heartbreaking on Friday because no one else in the family was able to say goodbye to her because it was sort of a um, urgent situation that her breathing was getting really bad. We had a big heat wave. So if any of you are um, in an area that had a big heat wave last week, um, she had a really hard time breathing by the end of the week. And so when I called her vet, they said to take her into the emergency vet. So I took her in um, and they said that they just couldn't get her breathing under control. And what normally would happen, especially with an older dog, is they could do a ton of interventions, which would probably be very uncomfortable for her, but she's probably going to tucker herself out with all the breathing. 
So that's the adult version. Um, the child version was the vet did help her die because her breathing was making it really hard for her um, to get the oxygen her body needed. Um, and so to be kind to her, um, the, the vet helped her die. And then my daughter asked how. And so I let, I let her know the same thing the vet told me. I said, well, they gave her one kind of medicine that made her go to sleep. And then they gave her another medicine that stopped her heart. And then the vet used a stethoscope to listen to her body to make sure that her heart had stopped. And then they let me know that she died. And then I stopped talking and then I gave it to her. And then she said, you know, that she, I, and I said, do you have any, you can have questions or you can share feelings. Um, and she shared that she was sad. And then we talked about sadness and we talked about how to hold that. And um, we spent the evening kind of sharing stories that were fun stories about our dog. So apologies for missing last week. Um, I hope that if you are trying to deliver difficult news, you remember those two things that we want to keep things true and brief. And we want to be as clear with our words as possible so that the child really accurately understands what is going on. Um, they are so, they're learning language at a really rapid rate. And sometimes they don't always understand the broader context of the language being provided to them. Even though it seems like they get most things, the child under six is not quite understanding things. And I'll actually give you an example. Um, we were listening to a sort of morning podcast that the kids listen to at breakfast. It tells the kids, you know, the day of the week and the date. Um, and then they it does, you know, sort of five minutes of little things where they tell kids jokes or they have the kids, they say, oh, you know, think of 10 animals. And it's a really sweet uh, way to start the day. And um, in this particular episode yesterday, they said, okay, try to think of 10 things that are hard, like hard. And they give an example, like wood is hard. So 10 things that are hard. And then they, the, the podcaster paused and the kids try and think of things and then they resume and give some examples. And the kids thought of um, wood because that's what the podcaster said. And then they, they said rock. And then my five-year-old said glass. Oh no, my eight-year-old said glass. And my five-year-old said, no, that's not hard. And my eight-year-old said, it is hard. Like I can't, it's hard when you touch it. And my five-year-old said, it's not hard because if you drop it, it breaks. And if you drop a rock, it doesn't. And I thought, oh, my five-year-old's definition of hard is durable. It's not physically hard as a state of matter. <laughs> it's, it's their definition of hard is durable, which is close, but not quite the same. So we have to remember that the child is constructing a language in the first six years and beyond. And we think that they have perfect definitions of all these words, but they don't. So we have to use words that are going to be as accurate as possible so that they, even if they don't really understand what death or dead is, that if we use that word in this context, then they have an understanding or they have a growing understanding of what this is. Um, so, and you can intentionally use that language, especially if you're dealing with a loss, you can use that language around other things just to make sure that the child's vocabulary expands to understand that. So um, we have some flowers from my husband's birthday that are in a vase that are wilting. So what does it look like to actually name that the flowers died, right? So how can we name that in the everyday life that we have um, so that the child really starts to understand what dead means um, when we use it for describing this life event for the family. So I wasn't here last week. We are going to full steam ahead <laughs> and talk this week in our Friday Five, where we talk about a Montessori toy, a non-Montessori toy, a practical life idea, a children's book, and um, I answer a parenting question. And I hope that you come join me live so that you can have your own questions answered every week. So 
upward and onward, here we go. I'm so glad I figured out the slide deck here. <laughs> so um, our Montessori toy and our non-Montessori toy, we're going to put together. I figured that out this week. <laughs> we're going to put them side by side so that we can compare and contrast. That's the idea is that we're going to try to understand the materials and activities that are available to the child from the perspective of development. And if the development is being centered in the activity, then that would be considered a Montessori toy. And if development is an afterthought or is not part of the creation of the toy and the toy's uh, intention and function is to entertain rather than to be a tool in the child's own development, then we were going to consider that a non-Montessori toy. So here we go. Pickler triangle versus the couch. <laughs> and actually this is reversed. So, <laughs> um, I mean, well, I'll say <laughs> the Pickler triangle is a Montessori toy that is considered a Montessori toy because it's built in alignment. Um, and the couch would normally be considered a non-Montessori toy, but I wanted to talk about the development and how the child uses something as a tool for their own development instead of using it as a piece of entertainment. So I would argue <laughs> that the couch is actually a really great example of a Montessori toy. Um, and I'm seeing the visual is a little bit confusing. So my apologies for not catching that, but the, the couch is not developmentally created, right? It's created as a sitting area, but imagine the child who is just starting to pull to stand, who is using things in their environment as tools for their own self-construction. That's what we want to have available for the child. So a lot of times you might see something like a Pickler triangle. Those are quite expensive or they're expensive in uh, dollars. <laughs> uh, they're expensive in money and they're expensive in time. So if you DIY it, it's a lot cheaper from the perspective of money, but it's expensive in terms of your time. It takes quite a bit of time to build up something like a Pickler triangle. So thinking about that Montessori toys are going to be things that the child is using as tools for their own development. They're not there for entertainment. I think that sometimes we see the Pickler triangle and we see it as like an indoor jungle gym. And that's, that's how kids kind of orient to a park, right? You've got a grass field, you've got trees, you've got tan bark, you've got wildlife in the bushes, <laughs> you've got all kinds of things. And then you plunk a, a, a kid's play area in the middle of that and all the kids now go to this one particular area and they don't go anywhere else. Whereas if that wasn't there, the kids would spread out, they would be in the grass, they would be climbing trees, they would be looking for wildlife. So when you put something in the child's area that functions for entertainment, the child's orientation to that is for entertainment. It's kind of like having a, a TV in the living room. That is a function and an orientation towards entertainment. So when you sit on the couch, it's kind of like, well, of course we're going to turn on the TV, right? Of course we are, because that's the orientation is towards entertainment, as opposed to having the thought, oh, let's play a board game and like have everybody read books on the couch or something like that. So the orientation tends to guide the interest towards the thing that's going to entertain them, as opposed to having things, seeing the environment through the child's eyes, where the environment is full of tools that the child is going to use for their own construction. So a child who's trying to pull to stand, the couch is actually a perfect level for them to try to um, cruise where they're holding on and walking. And then if they can let go and hit, go to a coffee table, or if they can let go and try to go to the seat of a chair, 
And that's another great thing that the child is going to use what's in their environment to be able to do the kind of work that they're trying to do. And the Pickler Triangle might be interesting to the child. It might be perfectly um, developmentally aligned in the sense that the child does have something to climb that feels safe. Um, but it does function a bit more like a jungle gym. And, um, and the couch is really, or the chair, or just the normal things that you might have in your space work exceedingly well for the child to be able to construct themselves. So um, I would argue here, <laughs> I'm going to say the couch is the Montessori toy and the Pickler triangle. I'm going to sort of, I know that it's often seen as part of a Montessori uh, curriculum. It's often seen as an aspect of the Montessori um, space. It's not misaligned to development, but it is the orientation the child tends to have with this is entertainment. And I would, if you have a Pickler triangle, I would consider spending a little bit of time observing the child to sort of say, hmm, I wonder what they're doing there. That is their orientation towards entertainment. Um, and they completely ignore the rest of their environment. Or are they really using this as a tool to do something in their self-construction. Maybe they really are trying to learn how to climb right now. And so this gives them an, an app or opportunity to climb. And, um, and then also watch them without it um, to see what they do in the space. Do they still pull themselves up and they try and cruise through the couch? Um, do they try to sort of go up and down and all around? And then do they spread out like the kids at the park? Like, do they actually not stay centered in this one tiny square footage? Do they actually go out to the shelves or check in with you or, you know, do do kind of other things that aren't so super concentrated on the piece of equipment that's um, generally for entertainment? And if you do not have a Pickler Triangle, <laughs> here's a stamp of approval to not bother with one right? Like that might be an interesting thing for you to make. I know that there was a family I was working with that DIY'd a pretty inexpensive Pickler Triangle. They got a sawhorse from, I think it was Home Depot, which was really inexpensive, just like a wooden sawhorse that you would use um, to cut wood. So you just have a couple of those and you put the planks of wood on top and then you can cut. So it can be a really um, versatile thing. But what they did is they then got rungs, they got dowels, and um, they screwed the dowels onto either side of the sawhorse and boom, Pickler Triangle. <laughs> it, it wasn't adjustable. So most Pickler Triangles have a hinge on top so you can um, change the grade of, of the sort of how steep it is. So the sawhorse obviously isn't going to do that, but it was perfectly interesting for the child. Um, but it's also something that you can completely skip because the child is going to use their environment with whatever is there to be able to do the thing that they're trying to do, which is get up on their feet and use something, hold on to it while they are trying to um, move around the room. All right, so that's my, and I'll reverse the pictures next time <laughs> so that it's clear. Um, and this is, uh, obviously, it's a block picture of a couch. Um, so I meant, you know, a regular, just standard couch. So let's take a look at our practical life idea. So um, some of the sort of standard things that might be coming up with, you um, uh, you and your daily life. That's what practical life is all about. It's not about, practical life is not about adding random tasks to your home life that have nothing to do with what you do every day. So practical life, if you never eat oranges, peeling an orange would not be relevant in your household. If you would like to start eating oranges and then incorporating the child in that would be fine, but that's not going to be the child's orientation. The reason why the child is interested in practical life in the first six years is because they see you as a successful adult version of who they're going to be. And they see what you, they're really keen on paying attention to what you do every day as a successful adult and saying, what does that look like? What, what can I possibly, um, what do I possibly need to know how to do 
in order to be that version. And so even though you think that these are silly little tasks of, you know, putting on pants in the morning and making breakfast and, you know, putting the dishes away, those little tasks are exactly what the child wants to do. And this is the perfect time to teach them. So um, one that maybe uh, you haven't thought of inviting the child, whenever you think about a practical life task, I would think, does my child have the motor skills to do this? So a crawling child, can they bring in the newspaper? No, <laughs> that would be really complicated for them to do that. If you, if you get a paper newspaper, right? So this is, if you don't get a paper newspaper, an example would be getting the mail, right? So this is probably going to be something that's for a walking child. But if you walk out to get mail out of your mailbox or if you walk down or wherever that is or if you get a sunday newspaper or a daily newspaper and instead of you going out to get that that's a perfect opportunity to have the child get that because if they can walk <laughs> they can walk and and get something and bring it back and then everybody gets to benefit from that so whether it's the mail or a newspaper, this can be a really helpful practical life thing. The child feels like they're participating. And then as they get older, it's actually a super helpful skill. So in the front of, of my um, home, there is a, we have a mailbox that's not an internal mailbox. So there's a key. And you know what? <laughs> a toddler preschooler doesn't love locks and keys. So giving the child the green light to sort of say, hey, take this key. Um, and you can get the mail and I'll show you how to do it the first time, but let them figure out um, how to turn it and, and open and then close and lock. All of that is really interesting to the child and it can start to just be really helpful. So now I have a five and an eight year old and I can now say, you know, who wants to go get the mail and they know exactly what to do or who can go, you know, while we're making breakfast, somebody can go grab the newspaper on Sunday. So it can be really helpful to just remember that practical life is all about incorporating the child into your daily rhythms, not introducing random things that have nothing to do with your home, but you saw it on Pinterest. And so you're trying to incorporate it into your home. So if you use a vacuum cleaner, they want to use a vacuum cleaner, not a broom. If you use a broom, then there's no need for a vacuum cleaner because that's not what they see every day. That's not what they're trying to emulate. Okay. Practical life. Now our book. So um, our book eyes that uh, kiss in the corner. Um, so this is a beautiful book. Uh, it was um, written, I think it came out in 2020. Um, and I believe the author has another book. This was one of her first um, sort of widely known books, but it's a really beautiful book about a daughter and her mom and just ta and her grandmother. And it's really uh, a great way to affirm um, different uh, sort of different bodies that also sometimes the way that our body is presented um, gets added into what we perceive about race and culture and ethnicity. And, um, you know, a lot of times if the ways that a body is being presented that is not presented in uh, the sort of white norm that is often um, provided of saying that whiteness is, is, is a norm um, particularly in the United States, that's something that we can disrupt um, away from that norm by providing the child um, the accurate norm that people's bodies look different. And um, there are different cultures and, and different peoples from all around the world, many of whom um, live in the United States. And um, to really move uh, help the child at a very young age to be able to celebrate difference um, and to be able to also have a window um, into or a mirror um, into themselves to see themselves represented. So um, books are really, really helpful in for young children as they're developing an orientation to people and humanity um, and secondly to race, which is uh, made up thing that gets, um, it gets, it, it seems to, to overshadow the humanity that we all bring to the table and children will absorb unconscious bias. They will absorb things from the greater culture. So if the greater culture is norming whiteness, 
the child growing up in that society is going to absorb that culture. And that's going to lead to othering children who, whose bodies do not present as white um, and um, prejudice and oppression all sort of follow that same idea. So it's really important in the child's first three years to provide different types of media and literature where a child is able to see themselves, um, particularly if they're in a body that doesn't present as white in a culture that norms whiteness. And it's important for white kids as well to see a window into seeing that whiteness, to disrupt that whiteness is not the norm. Um, and media and books is a really great way to do that. And this is a beautiful celebration of a child in her family who's recognizing parts of her body um, that she is really um, sort of noticing the sort of uh, connection with her mom and her grandmother. So it's a really beautiful book, um, and that's what we really want to focus on in the first three years. Um, we don't want to focus on oppression and prejudice because that's come out of <laughs> a whole journey, and we have to go back to the beginning of the fallacy that whiteness is a norm, right? So that's false. <laughs> that's not actually, that's not a real thing, but it is a real thing in terms of what's getting centered and what children tend to see. You go to uh, look at the dolls, you're going to tend to see white dolls. You're going to tend to see white characters in books. Not because they're the only characters, it's just that that's how this society is centering whiteness. And so it's really important that you don't start this work with the end of the journey, which is where these ideas turn into prejudice and oppression. You start with the beginning with celebrating difference and decentering whiteness. So it gets pulled out of this idea of norm. And it's actually normal for us all to be humanity and to all be different and to all have culture and to all celebrate the joyfulness of that difference. So we have to go way back to the beginning. Um, and so being able to provide literature and resources to children um, is really critical. So this is a really beautiful book. Highly recommend Eyes That Kiss in the Corners. And when you are looking for children's books, it is very helpful that you look for an author. So that's um, <laughs> really helpful. It, it, to diversify the media, you have to try really hard because if you just get books, because whiteness is centered, you're probably going to look at your books and say, oh, well, it's mostly white authors, white illustrators, white characters. So you have to intentionally disrupt that by looking for black and indigenous uh, uh, authors and illustrators and characters, as well as folks of the global majority. And I would check author, illustrator, character, right? So that's going to be the order because the author is the storyteller. So you can have characters that are representing different races, but if the story is from a, a, a white author who used a white illustrator, it's likely that there are unconscious biases that are getting put into that book. So sometimes when people think, oh, I, you know, if I want, if I'm looking to diversify the media that I'm offering to my children, we go to the third option first and we say, oh, I'm looking for characters that are from different backgrounds, but that's not actually where we need to start. Start with the storyteller who's telling the story and center <laughs> the stories um, that will provide the child with authentic diversity, then double check that the illustrator, that the visual story is authentically represented. And then you look for the characters to see broadly in the collection of books that I'm reading to my child, is my child building a worldview that people are different and difference is being celebrated rather than the worldview that white is the norm. And then there's this othering, which turns to prejudice, which turns to oppression. So eyes that kiss in the corners. Great book. All right. And last one, our parent question. Um, and uh, while we're live, you can always pop your questions into the chat and I will happily address them. And this is a great parent question. I get it a lot. Is there such thing as a bad toy? 
Um, so no, <laughs> I guess my first hesitation would be something that is going to, well, I wouldn't even say that. I was going to say something that is unsafe for the child would be a bad toy, but even then it really depends on how the child is interacting with it. Um, because the child can engage in a lot of self-regulation when they first engage with something. So for example, a coffee table, should you put corner rounders on it or should you leave it be? Um, the idea is that if you, um, if you allow the child while they're little to sort of explore their space, they're not going very fast. They can't get very high. And usually they're pretty close to the floor. So if they bonk into something, it's not likely to send you to the emergency room, but that little bonk, is what's going to give the child's body some information about, hey, around this particular thing, you've got to be a little careful. And so it's not to say that a, a coffee table without a buffer is inherently unsafe. It's really just an opportunity for the child to use um, regulation. So, but outside of that, um, in terms of toys, the, and this is really important that the child is self-constructing no matter what right? So the child is building themselves based on the experiences that they have in their environment. So you could pay no attention to Montessori. You could just be doing whatever you're doing and your child is still constructing themselves. You could have a, a really prepared space at home that's, you know, really aligned to the child's development. And, you know, we would call that Montessori and then you would go out of the home into a space that isn't prepared to, for them, right? So, so the child is going to have a ton of different experiences. We have to remember that they are going to use their environment as tools for their own self-construction. And what Montessori is uh, sort of recommending is to say, we should know what the child is trying to do in their development so that the tools they have access to are actually the things that you, they need. So for example, if I'm in the kitchen and I'm trying to make a, a pasta with red sauce, if I had all of the ingredients and the tools available to me, it would be very easy to make that sauce and the pasta and the meal. But if half the ingredients I didn't have, they're at the store, and the tools that I had, when the pot was way too small and, you know, the spoon didn't work very well, you know, it was like either way too big or way too little, I, I would have a harder time doing the thing that I'm trying to do. So that's the idea with the child is that, or, and with Montessori is that we're trying to optimize the space so it's easier for the child to do what they're trying to do. But that doesn't change the fact that the child is doing whatever they're trying to do already without anything else in the environment. So the toys, the materials, the activities in the environment are meant to be tools that the child uses. And so there's not a bad toy because kids will come up with all kinds of ways to meet their need, right? So, and I do that too. I problem solve all the time. If I can't figure out how to do something, I'm going to use whatever I can in the space. Like if something's stuck under the counter, you know, I'm, I'm going to, maybe I'll use my kid's paper airplane to sort of swipe it out. That's not what the paper airplane's for, but I can use it as a tool to do the thing that I'm trying to do. And kids do the same thing. Um, what I will say in terms of like toys that are counter to development, which I think would be considered like a bad toy, um, things that are actively blocking the child from doing the development that they're trying to do. I think a good example of this is a walker or a jumper, like those kinds of baby toys where you put the child into a contraption, like a little donut, and they sit in the donut, and then there's toys all around, or they sit in this little jumpy swing. So those are actively blocking the child from doing the development that the child is trying to do. Um, so I would say that those, um, I would, I would probably consider those, I wouldn't say bad. I would say misaligned because it's not like putting the child in that for five and a half seconds is automatically awful for the child. <laughs> That's not the way things work. It's built over time, but I would say 
the, I, the way I would think about toys is, are they aligned to the child's development or are they misaligned or are they kind of neutral and the child can use them as tools if and when they need to? Um, the Montessori toys, the things that we're going to think of as Montessori toys, those are the ones that are directly aligned to the child's development. The neutral ones are like, they can go either way. The child can use them as tools or they cannot. And then there's misaligned. So things that are actively blocking the child from doing what they're trying to do. And in the case of those um, exercisers, the, that's a lot of what they're, or the bumbo chair or any of those jumpers, if we think about the child's age and the motor skill that they're trying to work on. So a lot of times, you know, the bumbo chair is usually introduced around three or four months on um, the exercisor is definitely something around six, seven, eight months and same with the jumper. So if we think about the motor skills that the child has at those age, um, four months is usually the start of crawling, um, start of rolling. Six months is usually around the time of sitting. Eight months is usually around the time of crawling. So for a child, every one of those is mismatched. So the bumbo chair is a sitting piece of equipment and there it's only being introduced because the child cannot sit, but they cannot sit because that's not what they're working on. <laughs> they should be working on rolling, which means that they shouldn't be in a chair because they cannot roll. And rolling is what's going to shore up all of their core strength that allows them to sit at six months. And then at six months, what they really need to be doing is sitting. And when they do sitting a lot on the floor, they're going to start leaning forward until they get into a crawling position. So it's really important that they practice that sitting and they lean forward towards toys. They lean forward. They get into that forward motion. Whereas the putting them in an exercise or a jumper they can't, they're not sitting, they're actually standing or they're jumping and they cannot get to a crawling position because they're being kept in this upright role. And then if they're already starting to crawl around eight months, now they're being blocked from, from actually physically crawling and they're stuck. The whole idea of crawling is I can get myself from one place to another, but with the exerciser and the bumbo or the jumper, they're actually physically stuck. They cannot get from point A to point B. If they miss you, they cannot go find you. If they want that toy, they cannot go get it. But once they're crawling, they really can. So anything that act actively prevents the child from doing the development that they're trying to do, that's going to be um, a red flag in terms of a toy. But I wouldn't sort of say that these are bad toys because it's it's not like the child is in danger for being for immediately when they put them in this toy. This is a cumulative experience that the child has. Um, and the other byproduct of, of the experience with some of these toys is that the child starts to get frustrated on the ground. They start to get frustrated with the things they can do because they don't want to practice sitting because we've now told them that jumping is a possibility. They're like, well, I'd rather do jumping. So from the parent's perspective, we see a kid wanting to use the jumper and we're like, well, <laughs> they want to use the jumper. It seems to be fine. They love it, but they are being blocked and prevented from doing the development that they, their body wants to do. And now they don't even want to be on the floor because we've now introduced to their mind that jumping is a possibility but they can't really jump. <laughs> um, and so sometimes that can lead to the child's mental and emotional disposition as being frustrated because you put them on the floor and then they cry and they whine, whereas they wouldn't have been doing that if they never were introduced to the jumper and they would just be excited as soon as they started to crawl. And then they'd be excited when they pulled to stand and then they, and that's an orientation towards learning and towards their own development as I'm excited by my capacity, as opposed to I'm frustrated by my capacity. So that frustration can lead to learning obstacles later because they're going to constantly have this orientation of I can't do the thing that I really want to do. I'm constantly incapable, but that's just an orientation. That's just a learning disposition. So we want them to orient to like, I am constantly capable. And how exciting is that? So 
not not a toy I would choose, not a toy that I would recommend for all of those reasons, still wouldn't call it a bad toy. As I think that that orientation, um, you know, it, it's it's not, it's, it's sort of either or thinking um, and development and parenting is so much more uh, nuanced than that. I mean, life is more nuanced than that. So that's the end of our Friday Five. Thanks for joining me and we will see you next week.